holy words, aren't they? Father, uh, we ask for your help tonight as we open your word for just a few minutes to see you and to see your heart on display in your son on the cross as he provides a way for forgiveness and reconciliation to you by redeeming, by paying a price we could not pay because you're good and you're God. I pray you'd evoke worship in us over who you are and you would put us on a track again in faith to say, would you form Christ's heart in us? Come, Lord, I pray, in this time and be enthroned in our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, Lakeland family. It's good to see you. If you're a guest, I know we have many guests tonight, and we haven't met. My name is Dan. I'm on staff here at Lakeland, and and I just want to offer a welcome to you, and I want to say wherever all of us are at in our spiritual journey, this is a, this is a very safe place to say, God, I want to know you better. Show yourself to me. He's reaching out to all of us, especially through the message of Good Friday. If you have eyes to see it, an invasion has been taking place in our country and probably around the world for some time. I don't know if you realize, but there are a group of people living among us who have a a radically subversive agenda with an intention of nothing less than overthrow. Now, the architect of this revolution is gone. He's been gone for some time, but there are more of his followers um, influencing the world today than ever before. His name um, was Jesus of Nazareth, and his followers are his church, who are in this place to show him in what we say and how our hearts reflect what his heart is like. What is the heart of God like? And how dramatically different is it from the heart of us before he's worked in our lives in the world in which we're living. There is no place you see his heart more clearly than on Good Friday. I'm praying that worship rises in our hearts and he kind of breaks our little box we put God in and what he's like and we see him as he is, which is fundamentally different from us, except by the work of his spirit. And I pray we quickly say, God, make make me like you. Today, if there's a main point for this short devotion I have, it's this. May we praise and follow the Christ of the cross, of the cross, because of what's on display. The heart of God is seen in the Son going to the cross for us. And so may we, may we see what he's like. Let's just begin with this. Would you agree with me that the world that Jesus came into is a world full of self-promotion? I mean, what is the world like that Jesus came into? It's a world of self-promotion. Um, A mom was making pancakes for her son, Kevin, five, and Ryan, three, and the boys started to argue over which one was going to get the first pancake. And so moms, being a mom, saw this as a spiritual opportunity, right, to, to teach a lesson. And so the mom said to her two sons, you know, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. At which point, Kevin, five, turned to Ryan, three, and said, you be Jesus. That's what he said. (laughs) Now, can you imagine that happening in your home? Or your children would have gotten an angelic smile, right, when mom said this and said, oh, blessed mother, thank you for teaching me the better way. I will give the pancake away. Is that what would have happened? No, we are self-promoting from the cradle. And oh, if it was only children. I know of a story of a lawyer who wanted to look impressive on his first day on the job, and so he was in his office, and he saw somebody walking to the door, and he didn't want to look like he, was, like, like he wasn't busy and important, so he quickly grabbed a few files, and he opened them up and picked up his phone, and he started to talk on the phone with this sort of uh, cons- this legal jargon as he waved the man in who plopped down right there, and after a few minutes of this fictitious conversation where he was conducting important business, he hung up the phone and he said, can I help you? At which point the man said, yeah, I'm the phone man who's here to connect your telephone for you. (laughs) How much do you care about what people think of you when they look at you? 
I think it matters a lot to us. C.S. Lewis, this, I share this at least once a year. C.S. Lewis um, shared the um, commencement address that he gave to a group of graduating students, men and women, and he was cautioning them about what they were going to pursue in life. And what he said was um, that one of the driving motivations of the human heart is the desire to be in the inner ring. There's a ring of people. From the time you're a kid, there's a driving desire to be in the inner ring. And we need to feel that we're inside of some group that we admire or we can't live with ourselves. And so he was a scholar at Cambridge. He looked at other academics and he said, there are academics. It's not uncommon for academics to want to be published in prestigious article, in prestigious magazines, not because of the work, but because of the, the, idea, the desire to be seen as prestigious. He talked about business folks who really, really want to make a, a large salary because that means they can join a club which says something about how they've been seen. He talked in this, this message about kids in gangs who want to be in the inner circle. Everywhere we look, um, when you're in the inner ring, then somehow that says something about you. And one of the dynamics of being in the inner ring is that you're closer to the inner than others. So part of the dynamic is that you feel good that you are in a better ring than the other people who can't get into it. It is self-promotion. It's in us. We are constantly trying to promote ourselves. Our concern is the pursuit of self. It was into this world of self-promotion that Jesus came, and we see it in the book of Luke. As we open up chapter 22, um, we know that Jesus is just hours before being arrested, being tried for blasphemy of all things, pronounced guilty and worthy of death, He's just hours from having his body beaten, him being beaten and being scourged and being mocked and a thorn of crowns pressed on his head and muscled up Golgotha and stretched out on a Roman cross and nailed to it through his wrists and his feet and left to die by slow suffocation where he not only died at the hands of men, but all the more horrible in ways we can't imagine, he would hang there before God as our substitute bearing the sins of all of his people as if they were his and become the recipient of the wrath of his father. That's what's coming. He's just hours from that in the upper room when he's with the disciples. But what do we see him doing while he's there? He is joyfully worshiping God through the elements of the Passover, his father. He's participating in worship, and he's serving his disciples. But what are his disciples doing? (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's just overwhelming. We read this in Luke twenty two thirty four. 34. You know what their conversation is? A dispute arose among them as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. I mean, they're fully anticipating that Jesus is on the verge of imminently driving militarily Rome out of Jerusalem and establishing the people of God in the world. And so glory is coming. They just saw the triumphal entry and they want glory. There is something in our hearts that is always grasping to matter, for weightiness, for glory. And we see this in the disciples. Now, on one level, living in this world, it's not a surprise because in our world, this is what it is that we want. And Jesus acknowledges this. In verse 25, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentile, this is how it is. Those on the top, in the inner, inner, innermost ring, right? The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. So it's easy today to look at the disciples and shake our heads and click our tongues and say, how can you be so self-serving in the presence of, in the, presence of the Lord? But the truth is, there is something of this inside of all of our hearts. Recently, I was at the grocery store. I mean, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I'll just tell you, I, I wish I could tell you I am above such tawdry pursuits as self-advancement. But I'm in the grocery store, and I got a basket full of stuff. And, you know, I took geometry, so I can, I can figure distances and speeds, right? And I, I, physics, I think, I don't know what that was. I took those trains traveling 20 miles an hour. Anyways, all I know is I see a long line, and I see a short line. And I'm like, I can get to, I'm, you know, it's, it's intolerable to be in a long line when you can be in a short line. So I'm moving my cart. But then I also see another shopper who also sees the short line. 
but I immediately discern that I'm closer than the other shopper, so I maintain dignity and composure as I don't speed up moving towards the hole. But guess what? The other shopper, this guy speeds up perceptively. Can you believe he cared so much about being first? I mean, what's wrong with this person that he needs to be first in front of me? You know what I'm saying? Like, like there was a little flare inside of me because that wasn't for my good that he went first. Gosh, I was in a meeting a while ago and I had done something and it went well and someone in the meeting commended someone else and thanked them for the great job they had done. It was my, I did it. And I wish I could tell you, I was like, I am so glad that this person is getting the praise, but I I actually burned inside a little bit. I didn't say say anything. I actually did that. I just want you to know, right? I didn't. But if if that little guy hadn't been at the door of my mouth saying, don't say that, I might have. Self-promotion is in our hearts. It's, It's the culture of the world in which we're living. But Jesus stepped into it, and he confronts this in a fundamental way. And I say that because he, second of all, taught a different way. He taught his disciples the opposite of self-promotion. He called it service. Verse 26, this is just as clear as you can get. If the rulers of the Gentiles exercise authority over them, etc., not so with you, he says to his disciples period. End of counsel. This is not how my followers operate. When Jesus came to people like he did to Peter in the boat and to others and said, follow me, and turned and walked away, he didn't just say traipse behind. He said, akaluthao means walk in the manner that I walk. Watch how I walk. And walk like I walk. Follow me. And so in this area in particular, particularly self-promotion, has no place in the kingdom of God because the citizens of the kingdom of God are too busy promoting the people around them and ultimately the Lord whose glory they serve. It is the opposite of the culture of our world. You know, just even think, I I just, I still can't get over this. Is, yes or no, will God receive all glory in eternity? Yes or no? Yes? Yes, he will. Okay, so what image comes to your mind when you think of that? If you think of the Lord as being the recipient of all praise and all glory and adoration and sacrifice and surrender and so forth, if you think of that through the filter of our world, it is profoundly, I don't know the right way to say, God-centered? It ought to be God-centered, but there is something ironic about how glory works in our God who is a triune God. Because yes, while he is the recipient of all praise, somehow we see that unpacked in which our God is one God, but how somehow exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. It isn't that the Father becomes the Son who becomes the Spirit. When Jesus prays to the God, the Father, they're both there. So somehow our God exists in three persons who aren't a third of God. They are all equally God at the same time. God is community. And in this community, when it comes to glory, there is a remarkable humility and deference about the Almighty. Because the Father has installed the Son to be the one to receive all glory. He is the one who all authority has been given to me, Jesus said, because the Father wanted everyone worshiping the Son. And the Son is constantly saying, why are you worshiping me? There's no one who's good but my Father. And he is, in the end, we see him giving glory back to the Father. And the whole, I know I've said this recently, I just can't get, this still evokes worship in my heart. The Holy Spirit is saying, don't look at me. I'm here to show you how great the Father is revealed in the Son. There is, even in God's receiving glory, a deference, if you will, and a humility. It is unlike the way we think of glory. This is, this is Jesus. And so he says to his disciples who are to walk as he walks, not so with you. This self-promoting thing, put that self, put that to death in becoming a worshiper and follower of me. Notice what he promotes instead. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest. The youngest. What's true of the youngest? Well, when you think of your kids, what's true of them? They're not embarrassed to need something. 
Have you noticed that about kids? They don't have a problem asking for what they need at all. They're used to not necessarily being the center of attention. They know they don't have all power, and they're okay with it. And Jesus says, let children model for you the humility that is indeed what it means to be my follower in the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, and may, and may leaders lead as ones who serve. In our world, leaders are served. They're served. But in the kingdom of God, the greater the leader, the greater the servant. Just let that sink in for a moment. It isn't that God, who is glorious, is so magnanimous that he serves because that's out of character. Service is the heart of God. Almighty God. He leads as one who serves. And the one who is greatest is the one who serves the most. That's actually what the heart of God is like. And when we see this, when we see Christians live with this selflessness that's genuine and authentic and not put on and not pretend, it's startling. This is a man named Tim Winton. He was one of Australia's most celebrated novelists, had more than a dozen best-selling books. He'd won several awards. He was interviewed on... An, uh, he's Australian. He was interviewed on an Australian TV show called Enough Rope by Andrew Denton. Enough Rope. <laughs> yeah, I want to be interviewed on that show. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'll give you Enough Rope. At one point in the interview, though, um, the interviewer turned to Winston's, Winton's Christian faith, and Denton said, when you were about five, a stranger came into your family and affected your family pr- quite profoundly. Something happened when you were five that affected your family. What was it? And so Winton told the story. He said, well, my dad was a policeman, and he was in a terrible accident in the middle of the 1960s, knocked off his motorcycle, apparently he was a motorcycle policeman, by a drunk driver in a pursuit or something like that, and he was in a coma for weeks. After he got out of the coma, he was actually allowed to come home, and he was sort of like an earlier version of my father, sort of an augmented version but he was not, he was kind of recognizable, but he was not totally my dad. He'd been changed by this. Everything was busted up. And this man said, I was terrified. One of the places it really came to a head, Winton's father was a big man, and Mrs. Winton had a great deal of trouble getting him into the bath every day. I mean, there was nothing Tim could do as a five year old. This was, their whole world had been wrecked by this wreck. Now, news of this got out into their little community in Perth, Australia. And one day, there was a knock at the door, and Mrs. Winton goes to the door and opens it, and there's a gentleman standing there she's never met before who says, oh, good day. Did that sound Australian? That was pretty good. <laughs> my, name, my name is Len. I heard your hubby's not well. Is there anything I could do to help? Len Thomas was a Christian from a local church who had heard that a neighbor's husband was in really bad shape. And when, Winton, when Tim saw this, Tim Winton, he was, uh, sorry, Tim Winton, he was only five years old. He said, this man just showed up and he used to carry my dad from the bed and put him into the bath and he used to bathe him, which in the 60s in Perth, in the suburbs, was not the sort of thing you would see every day. According to Tim, this simple act of kindness from a single Christian had a profound effect. He said, it really touched me that regardless of theology or anything else, watching a grown man bother for nothing to show up and wash a sick man, you know, it really affected me. Len was demonstrating selflessness. And because of it, Tim became a Christian, and I suspect others. And this is what Jesus taught us to do. He taught us not just to serve as an action. He taught us to see ourselves as servants in our identity. And the moment that to you feels like it's a loss, you don't know the heart of God. It's a gift for us to be servants. It's a restoration of the image of God. We are being rehumanized. When servanthood is what we embrace, (laughs) it's a gift. 
And the, and the resistance that you're feeling right now to the idea that being a servant is a gift shows you how much the culture of our world right now is still intertwined with your soul. The reason that he could teach us this, thirdly, is because he is the champion. Jesus Christ is the champion of servanthood. He's the champion of serving others. Verse 27, Jesus says, For who's greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Now, no one really knows for sure. My best sense of these verses is not that Jesus is saying, this is what everyone knows, it's better to recline at the table. I'm wondering if Jesus is making social commentary on what we all think. Which, which is better, to recline at the table or serve the people reclining? How, yeah, yeah. And I'm not, I don't want you to, I don't want you to answer because I think most of us would probably say, well, to recline, of course. <laughs> Which just shows you how far we are from the heart of God. I think his point is, who's greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is not the one who reclines at the table? But then he says, but I am among you. I am among you as one who serves. Do you, there's a, I think there's a confrontation in that. This is a different way. Here sits God the Son, not just serving as an action, but being a servant as an identity. Now, let me just hit pause. If you've been reading Luke and you come to these verses, you know some things about this Jesus. You know he is the singularly most unique human being who has ever, ever been. When you open up the book of Luke, you realize that Gabriel, who was an angel who stood in the presence of God, he said it like, all angels don't do this. He stood in the presence of God. He visited Zechariah. And he said to Zechariah the priest, you're going to have a son, even in your old age, and your son is going to go before the promised Messiah and point. He's going to be the greatest prophet that's ever been because he is closest to the actual promised Messiah. He's going to tell everyone that's the Messiah of Jesus. And then six months later, Gabriel visits Mary. And that holy scene we've looked at so many times to explain that while she is a virgin, she would conceive in her womb and bear a son by the Holy Spirit and would name him Jesus, which means Yahweh who exists to save, God who exists to save. And Gabriel went on to say he would be great and would be called the Son of the Most High, that the Lord would give him the throne of his father David, that he would um, reign over the house of Jacob forever, and that, of, uh, that his kingdom would never end. God was going to enter the world through the womb of this young mother, Mary. We know this if we're reading Luke. And that explains why at his birth, <laughs> the army of heaven just couldn't keep silent. They, they for those, those poor shepherds, <laughs> they burst into visibility, declaring glory to God in the highest and peace on earth for all of those with whom God is pleased. And at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily like a dove, and everyone heard the voice of the Father coming from heaven above, declaring, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So here we are, knowing all of these things, seeing this Jesus at the table, and perhaps knowing what's about to happen in him going forward to the cross, he is here as one who serves. He serves us. He serves. He serves them, first of all, in what he does with the elements at the table. So we read chapter 22, verse 19, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out for them and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. He would serve them supper, but ultimately, he would serve them in the cross. He would serve them in what's about to happen. For when the time came, he would be arrested. He would be accused of blasphemy for which he did not defend himself. While he is the creator of lo the, and Lord of every person who was at the trial, he would bear blows and scourging and mocking and not call angels in his defense, though he could do it. He would die at the hands of men, but ultimately die before God. By the way, if you've never understood this, let me just 
Let me just say, why did, why, how does the cross, why is the cross the symbol of Christianity? Why, I have it on my ring, that's why I hold that up. Why, why was this so important? Just this last week, I, Thursday, I, I, was, I was down at Newman's actually, and I got in this long conversation with this group of guys who said the Bible's basic point is to teach us to be good people. And I said, no, 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 that's not what its fundamental point is. It's to identify for us a fundamental problem we all have. In fact, actually, the, this, the, I, said, I said this guy next to me, do you, do you want me to explain? He said, why are there all these different interpretations of the Bible? I said, that actually, what the Bible is trying to say is not hard to understand. It's, it's profoundly clear. Do you want me to tell you what it is? And he said, yeah, but he looked bored. So I said, I'm going to offend you. And he looked at me and said, what? And I said, I'm, a, I'm, I'm going to offend you. He's this retired cop. You can't, ref- you can't offend me. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> It was awesome. (laughs) And so I shared what the Bible says. The Bible says even though we may have done good things, who who of us is completely innocent of jealousy, of pettiness, of words of cruelty, of indulging in things that are just dark and harmful to us and others? Who of us are completely clean of that? And I, I shared this amazing thing in the Bible. Every single person that actually encountered God, they're just a few, you know, normally you die when you see God, but in a few places, God opened the heavens and he revealed himself to people on earth like us. And when they saw him, they didn't rise in worship and dance. They didn't have joy. They were terrorized by the presence of God. And what was it that was terrifying about him? Was it his majesty or his strength or his bigness? All of those things might have done it, but no, that's not what it was. Every single person that saw God called out and responded to the very same thing, and that thing is that God is holy. He is utterly and completely pure. And I, and I read that, and these, the last couple of years, I've just scratched my head and said, how can you look at God and know he's pure? How? How? I mean, I get you can look at him and know that he's powerful, but how do you look at him and know he's holy? And you know what the answer is? I have absolutely no idea. But every single person who saw him saw his holiness. And the Bible says God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. What happens when light and dark come in contact? Who wins? Always. Every single time. The light does. You don't turn the dark on. People respond to God's holiness in terror because they say things like, guys, yeah, I am ruined, which means I'm dissolving, like Star Trek's being transported. I feel like I'm a vap. They sound like darkness would sound when you turn the light on. We have a problem, and it's not outside of us. It's not the politics of our world and, and how bad my boss is and the terrible diagnosis. You know what? Our problem, our fundamental problem is that God is holy and we're not. And so astonishingly, God himself entered the world. And astonishingly, the only one who was actually completely holy did what none of us could do. He was nailed to a Roman cross. And from from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, darkness covered all of the land. And during those three hours, all of the justice that I deserve for my sins, Jesus bore as if they were his sins, so that God would still be just, but offer a way of forgiveness. Make no mistake, all sin will meet the, the holiness of God, all of it. Every sin ever committed by any person will be brought to justice. But for those who repent and believe, who are followers of Christ, Christ dies for us. And the thing that I want us to see is the servanthood of the heart of Almighty God that he got on the cross in your place. So how do we respond to this? I just, two things come to mind. The first, I hope worship rises in your heart. I just... In a moment, we're going to all sort of approach the cross. And I encourage you to look on it. This is an emblem. It might be nearly life-size, nearly. It's an emblem of another cross that Jesus himself was nailed to so that you didn't have to be. 
so that you didn't have to bear the justice that was yours. He did it to serve. That's what serving does. You come close to those who you love and you, do, you, you lay down your life to do everything you possibly can to put them in a better place. And the supreme example of this in all of human history is God himself dying on the cross in our place there. And so his heart as a servant is on display. And I encourage you to worship him. To even pause as you come to the cross in a moment and say, I'm, help me to know who you really are. Help me to believe you are. May I see you as you are. You're a servant. And worship the omnipotent servant. And the second is, you all got cards as you came in. These little cards that say self. Can I just ask, is self alive and well in you today? Are you worried about who gets the first pancake or or short line? How much do you care about how you're seen by others? Why? Why? (laughs) Because you're promoting, it's about you. Is self-existent in you and indulgences in your life? Is your heart different than his heart? Maybe for the first time, I mean, you may be here kind of new to church and haven't been here for a while. Maybe what you, what you want to do as you come to the cross is to say, Lord, I actually want to be your follower. I acknowledge to you that I have sinned, I, I'm, and I confess it, I repent. I say, I am sorry that I've not trusted you, that I've done things that are dark and evil. I knew it, and I've done them, but please forgive me for those things. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross in my place so I could be forgiven and filled with the Spirit of God and reconciled to God and become his child. Please, make me your follower. Fill me with your Spirit. May I be born again. Just say sorry, thank you, please, to him as you come to the cross, and something will begin to work in you. But for those of us who are believers, can I just ask, and as we begin to sing, I'd I'd, I'd encourage you to start by looking at this card and just asking, where is self at in your life? What's that look like? And answer, say to the Lord, I don't want this heart. I want your heart. I want to be a servant in faith with Christ formed in me. And then in a moment, as we're singing, we'll all stand when we go to pray. I'd encourage you to come out of the aisle and come to the cross. There are nails and hammers down below. And, and not just to go through the motions, but meaningfully as an act before the Lord, I would say take, take self, put it on the cross, nail it in, and then head to one of these two places where we have folks who are going to offer you communion. Jesus invites us to his table, to his fellowship, to remember his body broken for us and his blood poured out for us. You can take the elements right there or you can take them back to your seat and enjoy them on your own, on your own time as we worship. And then we'll continue in worship together of the Lord. Can we stand together? You know where Lewis is, when Lewis talks about the inner ring, you know the really hopeful thing that he says? He says, if you're a Christian, (laughs) if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been invited into the ultimate inner ring. You've been invited into the ring of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The Trinity invites you into their ring. You are welcomed by the only one who ultimately matters. And if that's the place you're in, you you have the freedom to not worry about any people's ring. In fact, you're free to spend your whole life trying to bring people into the ring you're in. This God who reconciles us satisfies our hearts to the core when we become worshipers of him with our whole life. So let's pray. Father, thank you so for the display of the cross, your heart on it, that Jesus, you actually went to it, a servant. May we worship you. It's easy for us in this world to worship you when we think of how you're great in the ways our world says. You're the most powerful, you're the wisest, you're the strongest. But Lord, you seem to be most worshiped that you, O God, are a servant. When all of heaven looks at the Lion of Judah, they see a lamb looking as if it had been slain. 
Help us to worship you aright for all of those things, but fundamentally that you, Lord Jesus, are here as one who serves. And I pray you would make us to see our, see our promotion of self as something to nail to the cross so that we would be servants of others and fundamentally servants of you. We'd embrace that with